survivors, we're back at it with an extra set of questions for my board of directors. And trust me, do they have some good ones? I can't wait to share them with you. Are you ready for number one? Let's do it. Number one, what were the red flags in the abusive relationship? So again, survivors were telling me red flags where it was just escalating. It wasn't get any. It wasn't getting any better. Emotionally, they were getting into a very deep, dark place that it was difficult for them to even start functioning outside of the home. Even within the home, they had moments where it was hard to step in without thinking that something was going to happen again. They were tiptoeing around their partner and it was just becoming a state of more confusion, more loneliness and more stress. Not only for themselves, even if they had kids, the kids felt the the negative energy coming from them and they would isolate themselves from their friends and family even more than before. So those were definite number one answers that I would get from them. For myself, the red flags, although my kids were not directly affected, when my kids were with me, I would be hesitant to provoke any kind of discussion or anything that would allow him to use it against me. So I was extra careful when my kids were around. And the other red flag was just trying to keep the house in order, keep everything perfect. So there was no excuse for him to use in case he found something out of place, then he would turn it on me. So I did my best Of course, again, once again, like unrealistic expectation of trying to make everything perfect. That way you don't upset your partner. That was my answer. Number two, walking with Christ now, what is the one thing you remind yourself to prevent this from happening again? (laughs) You know your worth. You know your value. You know that you are loved beyond measure. And there is nothing that anyone can tell you or anything that they can do or blame shift on you and make you feel less than. That would be my number one thing. The identity that I have in Christ pales in comparison to any identity that anybody would try to mold you into. When I spoke to the survivors, they, the ones that are believers, they essentially did say their self-worth and they feel loved, like they feel accepted. Again, that takes time and it takes something called a sanctification process where God is honing you to become just like him, closer to him. Let's go to the next question. What has been the most difficult part of the healing process for you? Oh, yeah. When I spoke to survivors and my board of directors, some of them had said that triggers, that's a very popular one. You're not sure when they're coming. You're not anticipating it. Sometimes somebody will make a gesture or somebody will approach you or they'll scare you. I know for myself, if somebody's walking in the room and I'm very focused on what I'm doing, I'll get easily startled. So I'm hypersensitive to those things. And also other survivors have mentioned those times where there's clues, right? Um, I wonder if this person is going to do what this other person did. And they're starting to get angry. Is it going to escalate? So then we start creating anxiety within our thoughts. And then within that anxiety, our bodies, our body language starts changing. Our heart starts racing. Our palms start getting sweaty. Those are the things that we don't like, but our body kind of naturally responds to that stress from the post-traumatic sy- syndrome that we, that we had in our past. And that's why it's really important to address it with a licensed counselor, address it with a close friend that has been through a similar situation. And those were the key things for me that I said, okay, well, I can't keep doing this for every little thing. Let me pay closer attention to it. One of the practices that I use is called introspection. So I need to pay closer attention to my emotions And what's going on in my mind if there's like a pattern, right? That's been another thing that I've trying to be more mindful of because I don't want it to affect me and affect the people that I love the most. I have to be very intentional with it. So when it happens, I pause, 
I'll step back, I'll step away, and then I'll say, look, just give me a few minutes. Something's going on right now. And then I'll regroup. And the people that love you, they'll understand. What has been the most difficult part of the healing process for you? I did mention that, but for myself, one of the things that I do want to re reiterate is the cost. The wondering what's going to happen next now that I've started a podcast it's a big journey and it's a big responsibility. So Christ leading me up to this point is like, where is this going to go? But he's got me and I'm just along for the ride. I trust him. I love him. And I've got faith that wherever he has me, that's where he wants me. And I just have to put all my trust in him. It is a little bit scary, y'all. I'm not going to lie. This is something that I've never embarked in in my life. And I just, I feel honored that he's chosen me to tell my story. So that would be like the biggest thing that's kind of scary. Number five, list some of the pivotal moments when you knew healing with Christ was real. Wow. So for those believers, they started noticing that their symptoms were subsiding. They weren't getting as depressed or feeling as lonely or feeling like they were less than. They started building like this armor, that armor of God that in scriptures we talk about. For myself, it was less fear. It, I had a sense before that things had to, had to be perfect in order to appear that everything was like well put together. But Christ just kept reminding me, I'm perfect. Be perfect in your faith. That's the one thing you want to keep striving for is just trust me. <laughs> and, and I will tell you, it's, it's been quite a, quite a climb. However, every single time he shows me something, it's for my good. So I just want to let you know that, that Christ is right next to you. He's not letting you go. He loves you so much. And that would be like my answer. Would, it was pretty much like perfection and fear. And the, we have two questions left. The next one is, where do you see yourself in a year? When I asked the board of directors and the other survivors after healing from partner abuse, they told me essentially they want to see themselves in a more, much more stable place because when you've, when you've already come out of something so toxic, you're not sure what you are going to look like. You're not sure if you're going to stay in that state of mind that you were in while you were in it. So for them, they were telling me that they just want to make sure that their symptoms are reduced, that they continue seeking help, and that they continue building up their confidence. That's one of the things that like resonated with me when I spoke to them. And where do I see myself in a year? I see myself traveling the world, speaking about my testimony and my story, and speaking to all of you to continue interviewing you and continue sharing the power of Jesus Christ through reconciliation, through forgiveness, through love, confidence, and trusting that he's going to do wonderful works in your life as he has in mine. And the last question. What makes me happy? So when I asked the board, okay, well, you're asking me what makes me happy. Well, what makes you happy? And they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And I feel the same way. I'm a part of something bigger than myself that I get to share with all of you. I get to do something good and honoring, and I get to educate you about what's going on with other people, the community leaders that I've already interviewed, other survivors I've interviewed. I feel like I'm on top of the moon. And the fact that he's turned my pain into purpose has been really God honoring. And I want to thank you again for joining me on another wonderful episode. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask me or in addition in the future for any guests that are going to be coming onto the show, I would love to hear from you. I think that's going to be very relevant because many of you are not local. Many of you are from across the entire United States. And some of you have very distinct stories, very particular stories, special stories that we may be able to draw some really unique questions from. So I want to hear from you. We are ending with a biblical verse. 
Words of encouragement. The Bible is awesome. As I've mentioned in my previous episode, I use the NIV Study Application Bible, New International Version. I've been using it for about 10 years now. And what I love about it is the commentary that it provides underneath. So if you have a question about a verse, more than likely it's going to be there. Not every single verse, ladies, but many of them. And one of my favorite verses goes like this. It's in Proverbs. King Solomon, he was a very wise king. He was the son of King David. It's in the Old Testament. And it's got many, many, many sayings about how to be wise. So a Proverbs 31 woman, some people are like, I can't be all that. Well, Proverbs 31 is many women. Realistically, we do the best we can. And it's God is the one that fulfills every single characteristic to refine us and to make us better, not only for ourselves, but for him and others and how to, how to serve him best. So remember, we can't do anything without him. And Proverbs 31, 25 goes like this. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. Verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. So the commentary that I want to share with you from this particular NIV study application Bible goes like this. The scholars, these are modern day scholars that have all come together. It's an incredible book. And I strongly advise if you are into reading, get a study application Bible because it's going to dig deeper into the word and you're going to get a better political and cultural context than if you were to just read it on your own. Proverbs has a lot to say about women. How fitting that the book ends with a picture of a woman of strong character. Great wisdom, many skills, and great compassion. Some people have the mistaken idea that the ideal woman in the Bible is retiring, servile, and entirely domestic. Not so. This woman is an excellent wife and mother. And single moms, too. And ladies that don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> she is also a manufacturer, importer, manager, realtor, farmer, seamstress, upholster, and merchant, entrepreneur, all the above. Her strength and dignity do not come from her amazing achievements. However, they are a result of her reverence for God. In our society where physical appearance counts for so much, it may surprise us to realize that her appearance is never mentioned. Her attractiveness comes entirely from her character. The woman described in this chapter has outstanding abilities. Her family's social position is high. In fact, she may not be one woman at all. She may be a composite portrait of ideal womanhood. Do not see her as a model to imitate in every detail. Your days are not long enough to do everything she does. See her instead as an inspiration to all that you can be. We can't be just like her, but we can learn from her industry, integrity, and resourcefulness. Ladies, that's a lot to take in. So be firm in who you are and what you've come out of. You're a survivor. You're alive. And you've been given a second chance. Any skill set that you have, hone it, strengthen it, or start discovering who you are and what you love to do. And God will lead the way. So again... Another word of encouragement, God is for you. He is your champion. He is your warrior, and he will refine you. I love you. God bless. And until next time, ladies, keep on thriving. God bless. Anymore,